Hebrews, please. Hebrews chapter number one. Hebrews 1, verse 1. You will find as you study the Bible, the book of Hebrews has great blessings in it. Great, great, great truths that you really don't find spelled out as well as they are in Hebrews. Hebrews 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, and being made so much better, than the angels. Father, bless this holy book now. In thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. One of the great themes of the book of Hebrews is better. Better. Christ is better. He's compared. And throughout that book, and always, in every way, he is better. It doesn't mean that the ones that he's compared with are bad, but it's simply more efficient, able to do for, further, go further, do more, and better. And so what we read over here in the beginning, in chapter number one, the book of Hebrews, is the prophets. The Lord Jesus Christ is the prophet. One of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament, and we don't, a lot of people don't think of him as a prophet, is Moses. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter number 18 and verse 15, Moses said this, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. Now this is as plain as it can be because Moses said, I am a type of the one who's coming. He's going to be like me. And that's what a type is. Types are great in the Old Testament to teach great truths. And so we find Moses is compared with the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses and Christ were sent to deliver Israel. They both were to deliver Israel. Israel had been in Egyptian bondage for 400 years away from their people. Moses and Christ spoke to God face to face. Amen. Nobody ever spoke to the Lord like Moses did. I'll speak to him face to face. And of course the Lord Jesus Christ said, if you've seen me, you've seen God. Moses and Christ were rejected by the people. Both of them were. When Moses first entered into the ministry, saw an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, he smote the Egyptian. And then the next day it was that he showed up and they said, who has chosen you to be a ruler over us? And so the next 40 years, Moses went off into Midian and stayed on the backside of the desert. Was not the Lord Jesus Christ rejected by his people? Of course he was. When he came the first time, they said, we will not have this man reign over us. Moses and Christ were sought after their birth to be killed. When Moses was born, he was put in an ark, of, of, um, in an ark there in the Nile River, and he was spared because God intervened. And even the daughter of Pharaoh was the one who raised him. The Lord Jesus Christ, was, his life was sought after by Herod the Great. He wanted to put him to death, but of course he couldn't find him because the angel warned Joseph, and they went down into Egypt. Moses and Christ died while leading the people. Amen. Moses could only take them so far at the top of Nebo. The Bible said God took him. The Lord Jesus Christ was leading his people, and he led them to the cross at Calvary. And there he said, this is as far as you need to go. You look at what I'm doing on this cross. Amen. There was a big difference, therefore, between Moses could only take them so far. Moses of the law could only lead these people so far. And at the top of Nebo, God said, look to the north and to the south, and he could see all the promised land. But Moses could not take them into that land. But Joshua did, and Joshua was the type of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was able to take them into the land. So unto Moses, all they could do is dream about the real promises of God. But the Lord Jesus Christ he gave them these promises. In the book of Hebrews chapter number 3 and verse 1, the Bible said, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. 
For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. See the comparison? Better. Inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every man is for every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And watch this now, Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after him. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Moses was in servant in the house of God. It was Israel. It was the people of Israel. It was the people who were brought out of Egyptian bondage. That's how big his house was. He didn't build that house. God built that house. But you see the Lord Jesus Christ is compared to him for the Christ has a house too. His house is much, much bigger than the house of Moses. It covers all of those that believe, the whole family of God. And the Bible says here that Moses was a servant in that house. But the Lord Jesus Christ is a son over his own house. Which leads me to believe that throughout eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ will always be known as the son of God. Amen. And we'll always know that he's Redeemer, the one who gave himself for us. For the Son takes you to the Father. No man knows the Father but the Son. And no man knows the Son but the Father. Amen. Amen. What's that mean, preacher? That means that there's just one that's ever been on the face of this earth that understands fully the essence of Almighty God, and that's the Son. And there's only one, my dear friend, and that's the Father who really understands the full and complete essence of the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man. We understand a little about it. We preach about it. We pray about it. And the Bible said he took likewise the same when he took our flesh. But his flesh wasn't my flesh. His life wasn't my life. There was something about Christ that was different from all of us. And he said, my dear friend, when you, when you, he said, when you see me, you've seen the Father. Amen. Amen. So the Bible teaches us clearly that when compared to Moses, who was a great man, to in no way put Moses down, he was a man who served when God put him but he's not Christ. There's another one in the book of Hebrews chapter number 6 that he's compared with. And his name is Abraham. Abraham. Of all the people in that Bible, Abraham stands tall at the top. Abraham and Moses are two of the greatest figures in all the scripture. And then you have, you have, uh, you have Job and you have Daniel. And my friend, these are names that are mentioned separate from everybody else in that Old Testament. Because they're so great in the presence of God. What is so great about Abraham? He obeyed the Father. He came out of the darkness into the light. All you've got to do today is to follow the light that you get. It may not be much, but follow that little bit of light that you get. Say, what is the light, preacher? Your conscience begins to speak to you. Listen to it. Somebody is speaking to your soul like you've never heard before. Listen to it. That is the voice of God leading you out of darkness. Abraham and his covenant that God gave him was the covenant that set him apart. He believed God. And the Bible said it was accounted to him for righteousness. But one of the greatest things that God says about Abraham, he says this, I know him. <laughs> Man, you talk... If that doesn't move your soul, nothing can. I know him. I know what he's going to do. I know where he'll lead his people. I know he'll, how he'll react to this circumstance. I know what he'll do over here. I know him. But my friend, he knows you too. And he knows me. Let me tell you something. He knows every one of us far better than we know ourselves. Most of us live this life that's created, this balloon, this bubble that we live in. And we try to be something we're really not. And my friend, we hate to come face to face with what we really are. But when you come face to face with what you really are, God can do something for you. Amen. You have Aaron mentioned in the Bible, Hebrews chapter number 7. Of course, Christ is greater than Abraham, but that doesn't put Abraham down. Abraham is used in the book of Galatians. Tell them plainly, he's the father of faith. If you believe in trust Christ to save your soul today, you are believing with the same faith that Abraham had when he trusted the Lord. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter number 7, it compares him to Aaron. 
Aaron, my friend, notice this carefully. When Aaron was the high priest, of course, of Israel, he was the first high priest of Israel. There are many that followed after him. But Aaron, being the high priest, could offer sacrifice for the people. He could stand on the seventh month, the tenth day of the month, on Yom Kippur. He could walk into the Holy of Holies, and there he could offer a sacrifice for all of Israel. They were outside. He was inside. He was standing over the mercy seat, and he was sprinkling blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. If the church you go to doesn't mention blood, get out of there and run as hard as you can and find you one that does. Amen. For without blood, there is no power. Without blood, there's no cleansing. Without blood, there's no salvation. Without blood, there's no relationship with God. So when Aaron offered a sacrifice, he offered a sacrifice of a dumb animal. An animal that didn't even know what was happening. And he brought that animal and offered its blood to God. But my friend, when the Lord Jesus Christ offered himself to the Father, not a dumb animal, he came on his own and he gave himself for us that we could be saved. That's the difference. That's the difference. That's the big difference. For he laid his life down. He said, no man taketh it from me, but he laid it down. Therefore, he offered a greater sacrifice in his approach to God. Sometimes that high priest in the Old Testament could get very shaky. And God's a holy God. And you don't cross that holiness. You don't violate that holiness of God. You get in trouble big time. My friend, when you did that, you'd be in trouble. In Psalm 110, though, when the Lord Jesus came to the Father, the Bible says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. To compare the Lord Jesus Christ with the Aaronic priesthood is to compare it this way. God sent his Son. A child was born, a son was given, and then the son approached the father, came back into the one who sent him. And when he walked into the presence of holiness, he was holy himself. He walked into the presence of righteousness. He was righteous himself. And God the father said to the son, sit down now, work is done at my right hand. You see, the Old Testament priest never sat down. His sacrifices never ended. He was never finished with his work. Nothing, the Bible says, the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. So he couldn't be, he couldn't be finished. He, there's no rest for him. Constantly, constantly, constantly. But the Bible says of the Lord Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. If you appreciate that, you understand the only one that can handle your sins is the one who died for them. If you really understand that, you'll understand what it takes to have a relationship with God. Hebrews chapter number 10 and verse 12 said this, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. My friend, my friend, do you see this? It was complete. It is finished, he said on the cross. And it's done. It's finished. You can't add to it. So he sat down on the right hand of God. The high priest of the time of Christ was Caiaphas. Caiaphas', uh, Caiaphas father-in-law was Annas. We had a funny situation going on, but at the time Christ was tried and crucified, it was Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the man who stood up and tore his breast. He opened his, tore himself, and accused him of blasphemy. And the one who sentenced him to death was Caiaphas. Caiaphas hated Christ. He hated everything about him, hated his message. He hated him with pure hatred. And they found not too long ago an ossuary. That ossuary had the name of Caiaphas on the side of it. So what is an ossuary? An, oss an ossuary is a thing, it's a box, and they put the bones in that box after the body had decayed. They put the body in what's called a charnel house, and it was in there long enough to decay. They took the bones out, and they put it in that ossuary. And then, of course, they respectfully, they would take it and, and put it in tomb it, wherever they put it. Well, they found his, and inside they found his bones. And my goodness gracious, here we, got, here we have an ossuary with the name of Caiaphas on the side of it and his bones inside. And I think to myself, what a remarkable thing. For my dear friend, that proved without a doubt that he was just like everybody else. He condemned Christ to death. But you won't find his bones. They're nowhere to be found. All you've got to do is produce his bones. 
times and Christianity would die just like that. But you can't find them because he arose from the dead. But I think this is God just putting a little asterisk in history. He wanted you to know that when it was found just a few decades ago, it hadn't been long. And we have Caiaphas. Now, he's a historical figure. And, he's, and, he's, and Josephus mentions him and other historical writers talk about this man. So what we have is a, is a, is a, is a verification of the authenticity, the historicity of the Bible. Don't ever let anybody tell you that man wrote that book and there's no power. That's a liar and that's an ignoramus. God wrote that book. All scripture is given by inspiration from God. Inspiration is a translation of the Greek word theos noustos, God breathed. And uh, we say, well, I thought a man wrote him. Man wrote what the Holy Ghost put upon him to write. That's inspiration. And I believe in the inspiration of the scripture. Don't you look at Matthew chapter 27, verse number 45. Matthew chapter number 27 and verse number 45, the scripture says this. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Matthew 27 verse 45. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about noon, high noon, until three o'clock in the afternoon. The historians Phlegon, Thaddeus, and Julius Africanus all refer to the darkness that covered the earth at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. Here we go. Here we have another extra biblical uh, support of what the Bible's talking about. Somebody says, well now, wait a minute, preacher, that was an eclipse. No, this was at the full moon. You couldn't have an eclipse. This is a supernatural event that took place when the Prince of Light hung on that cross and God let the earth know, if you don't have him, you'll live in perpetual darkness. And from noon till three o'clock, the Bible tells us that at the sixth hour, it got dark. For the sixth hour noon was the very moment that the high priest Caiaphas, now listen to what I'm saying. The sixth hour was the, at noon, was the very moment that the high priest Caiaphas, arrayed in his full priestly garments, began the procession in which he would enter the temple to slaughter a pure, spotless Passover lamb. The darkness that covered the land lasted until the ninth hour, the ninth hour being three o'clock in the afternoon. The exact moment, listen carefully, the high priest would be making his entrance into the Holy of Holies to offer the blood of the Passover lamb to cover the sins of the nation. Give you a little understanding. You have a court of the temple. There you have a brazen altar and you have a laver. Sacrifices made at the brazen altar. Then you enter into the holy place. The holy place has a seven golden candlestick menorah. You have a table of showbread. Then there is an altar, a burning altar of incense, golden altar. And behind that is a huge curtain. Now, when we're looking at the temple, it is a kind of a, it's kind of a growth from the tabernacle. Everything's bigger in the temple. When you get to this, this, this curtain that's hanging down, it was there at the cross, John chapter 19, verse number 30. That the Lord Jesus Christ said, it is finished, finished. Here's Caiaphas. He has this blood sacrifice of the Passover. He's about to go behind this huge curtain. And he's going to put it up on the altar. He's going to put it on the mercy seat. He's going to offer it as a sacrifice to God. God Almighty busts that curtain in two. He rips it from the top to the bottom. And Caiaphas, no doubt in my mind, was probably shocked to death to realize what had happened right before him. In plain words, the Lord said to Caiaphas, wasting your time, son. The sacrifice and the blood has already been given. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. They tell us that that veil was 60 feet high. That's high, folks. 30 feet wide and an entire hand breadth in thickness. Look, we're talking about thick and it took 300 priests to move or manipulate it. It would have been impossible, humanly speaking, to tear such a veil. And yet God reached up there with his little finger and he ripped it from the top to the bottom. And the way was opened. And now we have a new and living way. 
new way, living way, a living way, folks. The Lord Jesus Christ, through his flesh, the life of the flesh is in the blood. When the God-man ascended in the presence of the Father, he ascended and he took me with him. For we have been accepted in the beloved, every one of us, Amen. in him. I don't have to worry about the Father looking at me. I just hide in the Son. Amen. I'm all right. Got no problem. So what do you say that, preacher? Because I'm going to tell you something right now. I have fear of God and that almighty, eternal, absolute, invisible being. You don't want to walk in front of him. You don't want to get into his presence unless you have the Son. And with the Son, there is complete and total and safe access unto the Father. In the book of Matthew, chapter number 27, we read, I'm going to get it over here, jump too, jump too quick. In Matthew chapter, number, uh, Matthew chapter number 27, we read these words, verse number 53. And they came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. They who? The Bible says when that earth shook at his death on the cross, the earth is dark. You can't see your hand before your face. God shakes the earth. And there we have, we have secular record of the earthquake. We have them talking about the earth shaking at that time like they had never had before. And when that happened, the graves were opened. The graves were all opened. These graves open, and you could walk by that grave and look down, and there were the bones. There was bodies of loved ones all around the place. And they lay there. Nothing moved. Nothing happened. Why would he open the graves and do nothing? What makes sense of that? It is because when those graves were open, he was in the heart of the earth. He'd already died on the cross, three o'clock in the afternoon. He descended into the heart of the earth. And then on the third day, who the man who is the resurrection and the life, when that resurrection and life arose from the dead, those graves that were open many of the saints arose from the dead. You see, when he came up, they came up. He's life. He's the resurrection. And so they that had died in their faith in him, that looked forward to the promise of God, they arose with him. You see, the Bible said, I am the resurrection. I want you to understand something in here this morning. This is so important. I listen to this religious garbage these days, and it just absolutely makes me sick at my stomach. There's so much stuff about what I do. What am I going to do? How do I accomplish this? You know, what can I do? This and that. It's already been done, folks. It's already been done. It's already. It's, that's what it is finished means. He is our peace, that Bible says. What is peace? Peace is where you sit down and rest. Because God has done for you what you cannot do for yourself. Some of you toss and you turn. You don't have any peace. It works on your mind. And the Bible says, there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. So if you're living a wicked, godless life, you can count on this. You're not going to have any peace. You're not going to have any. But I have peace today. What is my peace? Does God give you peace? Well, he may give it to you. But the point is, he's the peace that he gives you. The Lord Jesus Christ is our hope. He's our hope. He doesn't give us hope. He is our hope. He's coming one. He's coming again. Hallelujah. And he is our righteousness. Righteousness means right standing before God. Not by my own righteousness. Not by any good deeds I've done. He's my righteousness. And therefore I receive him as that. He's my savior. Amen. I need a savior. How many of you have lived long enough to understand you need one? Quit trying to save yourself. You need a Savior. You know you need one. Well, there's only one. Neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. But the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Greek for Jehovah saves. Jesus, Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves. Hallelujah. He saves. You say, preacher, I don't know if I'm saved or not. Hold your hand up right here a minute and look at it. See that hand? Move your fingers. Yeah, I can do it. Do the other side over there. You know why you can do that? Because you're alive. 
Nope, no problem. I'm alive. If you're saved, you're alive spiritually. And you'll know it. If you're spending all your time in doubt and you don't know that you've been saved and you worry day in and day out, day in and day out, it's because you won't put your trust in the Savior to save you. What can I do, preacher? What can I do to get him to save me, preacher? I've tried everything I know to do. I've quit this. I've quit that. I've gone here. I've gone that. I've gone on pilgrimages. I've read this, read that. What can I do, preacher, to know that I'm saved in your soul and in your spirit? Deep down inside of who you are, you reach out to the Lord Jesus Christ and take hold of him with everything you got, and he becomes your Savior. And don't turn loose of him. Him, not your righteousness, Him. He's the Savior of all mankind. He's my justification. He's my redemption. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. I think that's one of the songs that you'll hear in heaven. I believe heaven is full of singing. God gave us singing, Ezekiel chapter number 28, to worship the Lord. I believe heaven is full of singing. I told a little girl was passing away. She was about five years old, dying from cancer. Family was standing in the room with her, crying, but they knew the Lord was about to come and get her, not long. And she rose up in bed, and she said, Mama, the angels are singing. They're singing. They're singing, Mama. Can't you hear them? They're singing. And she laid her little body back down and was carried by those angels into the presence of the Lord, listening to them sing. They're singing. Why are they singing? Because that worships God in music. God gives music as a universal language. You may not understand a word they're singing, but you'll understand the music. They're singing in glory. Father, bless your word. Bless it this morning. I preach Christ, and I've preached him crucified. I've lifted up the Son of God, not me. I've lifted his holy name up and not the church. I've, not, I've lifted him up and not the ministry. I've lifted him up, our Heavenly Father, because he alone deserves to be lifted up. Bless his righteous, sweet, holy name. Now, Father, there may be some in this house today. Lord, they, they're sincere. They mean well, and I'm glad for that. But our Heavenly Father, they don't know in their heart for certain that they're saved. They're just not sure. They hope they are. They're trying to do the best they can. But Heavenly Father, that won't do it, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy hath saved us by the washing of regeneration. Father, I pray for them that they'll just simply walk down here this morning and by simple faith take you at your word and say, Lord Jesus, I'm taking you at your word. You are becoming my Savior right now. Save my soul and write my name in heaven. In thy name I pray, and heads are bowed, and nobody's looking. Did you hear me pray that prayer? Are you in this house today and you don't know for certain you're saved? You don't know that you are. You hope you are. You're trying to do the best you can. You've been a good person, but that won't do it. Would you raise your hand and say, pray for me, preacher? Pray for me. Pray for me. God bless you. God bless you there. Anybody else? God bless you. Anybody else? Raise your hand. Say, pray for me, preacher. God bless you. God bless you right there. God bless you. Anybody else? Raise your hand this morning. God bless you back there. Listen. He came, and by the grace of God, he should taste death for every man. Would have all men to be saved. All men. All men. He excludes none. He's the Savior of the world. Anybody else? Raise your hand and say, pray for me, preacher. Pray for me. Pray for me. Father, I pray for these folks who raise their hand. Lord, you know how far I can go. I've gone as far as a human being can go. I pray for them. I intercede for them this morning. But my Heavenly Father, I can't go, Lord, into that Holy of Holies. I can't come into your presence like they can. This is their special moment. This is their time where all they've got to do in their heart and in their soul is to cry out to thee. Lord, in their own heart, and their own way, is to take the Lord Jesus Christ into their soul and receive him as their Savior. I pray that that would be done. In thy holy name, amen. Stand up here this morning, folks, and sing.